Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Good morning. Yes. Hello. Hello, Frank. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome on in. Hello. Yes. Good morning. Are we awake yet? No. No, we're not awake. I am not. <laughs> I am not a morning person, everybody. Forgive me. I will apologize right now <laughs> for that. I most certainly am not a morning person. <laughs> But I'm trying. I will try. <laughs> I'm I'm up to it. I'm up to it. I just might be a little bit grumpy. <laughs> I'll try to not be grumpy. But oh, three fifty p.m. Good afternoon, Deborah. Hello. The law does not sleep. It certainly does not. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I thought I would hop on just a few minutes early and say hello. And uh, kind of, coffee's almost done. Yep, yep. <laughs> Mine is almost done also. I'm still working on it. I'm not sure if it's working yet. <laughs> My coffee. <laughs> oh, can you be grumpy? Right, right. Well, you know, that's a good question, Andrew. Although I tell you, I just, I'm just not a morning person. I'm just not. <laughs> I don't do well in the morning. That's not that's not my best time. <laughs> I do try, but <laughs> it's not my best time. Yes, hello, hello. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Hi, Vicki. Good to see you. Mandy, good to see you. Roberta, oh my gosh. I'm in the central time zone. So I'm in the, the middle time zone. <laughs> yep, yep. Yes, good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Love it. Love to see it. How long have you been practicing? Well, um, let's see. Let me try to, how can I put it in a way that doesn't give away that I'm a really, really old lady? <laughs> um, I've been practicing for a very, very long time. How's <laughs> that? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> It's been a long time, everybody, a long time. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do, I know, I know, afternoon. <laughs> yes, 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 oh my gosh, Ugh, I know, it's morning, but I'm glad to be coming. I mean, this is really the perfect time for this, so. <laughs> My goodness, do you enjoy it? I love it. I love it. I did not enjoy it for many years. <laughs> I certainly did not. But um, once you can kind of, I think, mold your profession into what you're most comfortable with, that certainly helps. <laughs> I've been very, very lucky to be able to do that. So, yes, good morning. Hello, Kristen. If a misdemeanor DUI is past two years, how is the statute of limitations handled? So if a criminal case is past its statute of limitations, if there's no exceptions, then, you know, that's something that you can challenge. The defendant would challenge that, file a motion to dismiss on the grounds of statute of limitations. Side note, that's not legal advice. That's legal information, but that's the um, vehicle you would use. There can be some reasons why, though, the statute of limitation is paused, so there may be special circumstances. That does happen sometimes. Have you thought about teaching? Yes, yes, I and I have taught uh, for many, many years in the past. Um, so yes, that is something that I really do enjoy doing, for sure. Um, nearly 1 a.m. in Australia, oh my goodness. Well, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Good to see you. Glad you're here. <laughs> oh my gosh, my um, my partner in crime has his um, his A L E X A set to an Australian accent, and so every time I hear it, it's like, "Good day. Do you need to order more paper?" Like, what? <laughs> what just happened? Oh my gosh, I love it. I love it. 
Yes, yes, 10 a.m., yep, yep. Nope, I'm just, I just came on Navy Vet. I'm just saying hello to everybody and giving everybody a chance to come on in, so. <laughs> Uh, yes, I don't want to say the A word. <laughs> I agree. I Yeah, I, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yes, well, you know, and I have, I have taught law for many, many years. I'm not currently um, teaching at the moment this semester uh, and next semester, so... I'm not currently, but other than teaching here on TikTok, this is really, I, I love it here because I can still teach people, but, um, you know, I'm able to do it in more of a flexible format. So, yes. Oh, well, yes, George. Hello. Yes. Yes, exactly, Mary. Yes, I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying. Right. I'm trying to teach. And, you know, I love teaching. I really do. And had a few things that happened that made it so I'm not able to actually teach in a classroom right now so this is really helping me a lot <laughs> to be able to uh, hang out with everybody so we'll take a break I know I know <laughs> well I will be I will be I do have a scheduled break coming up so <laughs> yes well George you gotta be patient here I've still got three minutes before um, I'm actually set to go so I'm just waiting a little longer for more of my mods to come in and join us our gain oh that's so sweet I appreciate that how long do you do this well I'm starting to have my lives go a little bit longer or a little bit shorter than what they were before they kind of were going a little too long so I'm trying to keep my lives under 90 minutes at this point so kind of in that one hour an hour and a half range seems to work best so my um, voice can heal I've got a a little I had a vocal injury when I was in college and it's kind of left some uh, problems when it comes to talking too much so I try to keep my uh, my content here to about 90 minutes these days that seems to work out the best so so fascinating oh thanks Jen yeah yeah I mean there's just a lot of fun information out there Yes, what kind of a mess? Oh, absolutely, and that's brilliantly put. That's brilliantly put. <laughs> Did you spend the, okay, redoing my nails. Now, I knew somebody was gonna ask me about my nails, all right, I knew it. So here's the deal, I gotta, let me just, I have a confession to make. There was an incident <laughs> last night. I was cutting celery. <laughs> and and what, I lost one of my nails, uh, I had cut, my nail <laughs> so I had to redo my nails so I was quite upset actually because they were one of my favorite sets but you know I mean you just you got to pay attention when you're cutting celery everybody <laughs> yes yes it was very sad <laughs> it was a sad moment there was some morning usually I don't get upset about my nails but um you know when you make a silly mistake like that and you just wish you could turn back the clock and, and do it right, but it, it happens, it happens. <laughs> oh, absolutely, when you're in a kitchen or a restaurant. Oh, absolutely, yes, of course, you have to be very careful. Don't you hate it when the, ha I do, Deborah. I do, <laughs> I do. Oh my gosh, yes, yes, better your nail than your finger, excellent point, and I was, I was very thankful, uh, very thankful, and you know, I'll, my eyes were protected, so <laughs> it could have been a lot worse, but that just meant I had to uh, redo my nails <laughs> then for today. Oh my gosh, oh, they still look great, well, thank you, Lindsay, I appreciate that. Oh, yes. Love your ring and love the morning lives. Well, thank you, CJ. Yes, this is this is one of my favorites. Um, this one I did get when I was in Key West. So I do remember where I got this one. But it's one of my favorites for sure. For sure. Um, I believe, I think this is just blue glass. But then these are, is it Mark Marcus? site mark a, something like that the little black little black um gems in here that shine a lot so those are a lot of fun i appreciate that 
What does at all mean? It means and to everyone else. So it just means there are more people that they didn't list with the name. Mm -hmm. Marcasite. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. What's cut my finger while chopping butternut squash? Oh my gosh. That's sad when you sustain an injury over squash. Squash just doesn't seem worth it to me, in my humble opinion. I mean, I don't mean to be hating on squash, but you know, the truth is the truth. So <laughs> I put it out there. Yes, good morning, good morning. Well, hello everybody. All right, the clock has just tipped over into uh, 10 o'clock Central Standard Time here. So welcome everybody to our uh, Sunday morning live <laughs> today. Oh, it was carrots, yes. Well, now carrots seem a little bit more worth it, you know. I'm already crying. <laughs> Frank, pace yourself. <laughs> Are these billable hours? No, they're not. They're not. I, I suppose I could look at them as pro bono hours, maybe. They're just, um, you know, my uh, my happy place to come on and share information. So, <laughs> really, oh, like ham hocks. Wow. All right. Again, I would say that would be worth it. I really think just squash isn't worth it. <laughs> no offense to the squash lovers out there. <laughs> Ah, community service hours. <laughs> yes. Tax write-off. Oh, I need to look into the tax laws about that. <laughs> Work on that a little bit better. So, all right. Let me um, sign off on the pro bono hours. <laughs> so funny. Oh, no. A glass watering ball. Oh, no. That stinks. Oh, my gosh. What college did you graduate from? I graduated from a college in the central time zone. <laughs> which is also where I went to an accredited law school. So <laughs> both of those are in the central time zone. <laughs> and I did um, get, uh, I did pass my bar examination. So I was licensed in my state as well. All right, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So today's uh, morning live that we're going to talk about is going to be the lawsuits that were out of the January 6th. Uh, rally insurrection uh, what, what do we want to call it what, what should we call it uh, you know they call it so many different things but the the riots maybe happy I caught you yes welcome Lisa do you do you do your nails every day the blue was so pretty oh I know I know I had a um, yeah I had an incident so I had to change <laughs> I had to change my nails I had an uh, unfortunate incident. So the fiasco, yes, we'll call it the fiasco from now on. So yes, I, I had planned to have uh, those nails for quite a while, but it just didn't work out. Such is life, such is life. So this is, again, this is the lawsuit brought by multiple people out of the January 6th situation, the Wizard of Oz incident. <laughs> That's so funny. And uh, this case had been filed. I will take you through the procedural history, what the claims were, who the parties are. So we'll do a little introduction here, uh, setting out the facts and the procedural history. So this was filed in D.C. and district court held. Uh, there was not an overall absolute presidential immunity involved, uh, along with several other pieces regarding being able to go forward on the suit. It was appealed then, and this is the appellate decision the appellate decision was filed in February of 2022, so it is actually still in the works. It has not been set for trial at this point. It was appealed one more time, and they just lost, again, their last appeal to try to get it dismissed. So it has not been reversed. It's not been dismissed. It is still on the docket, but incredibly slow moving, which is very normal, very typical for civil lawsuits. So I'll take you through the appellate court's decision here, which goes into the content of the speech on January 6th, the harm that was done, and the petitioners here who are suing Mr. Trump for his rhetoric that day. All right, so uh, we should have, uh, I've tabbed out, this is 112 pages, but I've tabbed out really the key pieces uh, because I don't want to uh, go through every single page, but I think it's important that we go through the introduction and the facts. And then uh, the biggest arguments I want to go through are the presidential immunity questions and then the First Amendment protections questions. So that's really what we'll focus on today. 
insurrection, call it what it was. All right, yeah, fair enough. I mean, there's just a lot of different ways uh, to call it. All right, one second, I need to refill my coffee. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Can you do a sticky note? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I will set that up right now. Um, I think I need to switch to a cold beverage. Here we go. So our sticky note today will be a civil lawsuit here. Civil lawsuit against Trump. Trump, and then for January 6th. All right. Here we go. All right. So we've got that. Yes, first sticky note. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm cooking brunch and listening. Oh, well, hello. Yes. Oh, yes, it does. Definitely. I, I love the sticky note idea. I'm not, I can't remember who suggested it, but whoever did, genius, genius work. Absolutely. All right. So we'll start off here um, giving a little introduction, going through the course introduction and then the facts. So let me just double check. Am I in frame? Okay, everybody. Just want to make sure here. Stick with the fiasco. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, we're in frame. We're in frame. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Let me um, grab my pen for today. Trying to get the courage to work. I know, right? It's early, everybody. It's early for me. I'm not. I am not a morning person. All right, here we go. Introduction. Again, this is an order written by the Court of Appeals out of D.C. So let's take a look. On January 6th of 2021, it was supposed to mark the peaceful transition of power. It had been that way for over two centuries. The presidential administration handing off peacefully to the next President Ronald Reagan, in his first inaugural address, described the orderly transfer of authority as nothing less than a miracle. Violence and disruption happened in other countries, but not here. This is the United States of America, and it could never happen to our democracy. Now, I will bump down and check on this footnote here from President Reagan. So here's a quote from President Reagan. To a few of us here today, this is a solemn and most momentous occasion, and yet in the history of our nation, it is a commonplace occurrence. The orderly transfer of authority, as called for in the Constitution, routinely takes place as it has for almost two centuries, and a few of us stop to think how unique we really are. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. That was President Reagan's speech, but it did that very afternoon. At around 1.30 p.m., thousands of supporters of President Donald J. Trump descended on the U.S. Capitol building, where Congress had convened a joint session for the certification of the Electoral College vote. The crowd had just been at the Ellipse attending a Save America rally, where President Trump spoke. At the end of his remarks, he told rally goers, we fight, we fight like hell, and if you don't fight, you're not going to have a country anymore. The president then directed the thousands gathered to march to the Capitol, an idea he had come up with himself. About 45 minutes after they arrived, hundreds of the president's supporters forced their way into the Capitol building. 
Many overcame resistance by violently assaulting United States Capitol Police with their fists and with weapons. Others simply walked in as if invited guests as the Capitol Police valiantly fought back and diverted rioters. Members of Congress adjourned the joint session and scrambled to safety. So too did the Vice President of the United States, who was there that day in his capacity as President of the Senate to preside over the certification. Five people would die. Dozens of police officers suffered physical and emotional injuries and abuse, and considerable damage was done to the Capitol building. But in the end, after law enforcement succeeded in clearing rioters from the building, Congress convened again that evening and certified the next president and vice president of the United States. The first ever presidential transfer of power marred by violence was over. These cases concern who, if anyone, should be held civilly liable for the events of January 6th. The plaintiffs in these cases are 11 members of the House of Representatives in their personal capacities and two Capitol Police officers, James Blassingame and Sidney Hemby. Taken together, they have named as defendants President Trump, the President's son, Donald Trump Jr., the President's counsel, Rudolph Giuliani, Representative Mo Brooks, and various organized militia groups, the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and War Boys, as well as the leader of the Proud Boys, Enrique Tarrio. Plaintiff's common and primary claim is that the defendants violated 42 U.S. Code 1985, a provision of a Reconstruction Era statute known as the Klan Act of 1871. The act was aimed at eliminating extra legal violence committed by white supremacists and vigilante groups like the Klan and protecting the civil rights of freed men and freed women secured by the 14th Amendment. Section 1985-1 is not, however, strictly speaking, a civil rights provision. Rather, it safeguards federal officials and employees against conspiratorial acts directed at preventing them from performing their duties. It provides, if two or more persons in any state or territory conspire to prevent by force, intimidation, or threat any person from accepting or holding an office, trust, or place of confidence under the United States, or from discharging any duties thereof, or to induce by like means any officer of the United States to leave any state, district, or place where his duties as an officer are required to be performed, or to injure him in his personal or property on account of his lawful discharge of his duties of his office or while engaged in the lawful discharge thereof or to injure his property so as to interrupt, hinder, or impede him in the discharge of his official duties. The statute, in short, prescribes conspiracies that, by means of force, intimidation, or threats, prevent federal officers from discharging their duties or accepting or holding office. A party injured by such a conspiracy can sue any co-conspirator to recover damages under this statute. Plaintiffs all contend that they are victims of conspiracy prohibited by 1985 code section. They claim that before and on January 6th, defendants conspired to prevent members of Congress by force, intimidation, and threats from discharging their duties in connection with the certification of the Electoral College and to prevent President-elect Joseph R. Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris from accepting or holding their offices. More specifically, they allege that before January 6th, President Trump and his allies purposefully sowed seeds of doubt about the validity of the presidential election and promoted or condoned acts of violence by the president's followers, all as part of a scheme to overturn the November 2020 election. Those efforts culminated on January 6th when the president's supporters, including organized militia groups and others, attacked the Capitol building while Congress was in a joint session to certify the Electoral College votes. Notably, plaintiffs alleged that President Trump's January 6th rally speech incited his supporters to commit imminent acts of violence and lawlessness at the Capitol. 
Plaintiffs all claim that they were physically or emotionally injured or both by the acts of the conspirators. I'm taking a beverage break here. Plaintiffs advance other claims as well. Swalwell alleges a violation of 1986, a companion provision to 1985. The statute makes a person in a position of power who knows about a conspiracy prohibited by section 1985 and who neglects or refuses to take action, to take steps to prevent uh, such conspiracy is liable to a person injured by the conspiracy. Swalwell claims that the president, that President Trump, Trump Jr., Giuliani, and Brooks violated the 1986 section by refusing to act to prevent the violence at the Capitol. Swalwell and the Blessing Game plaintiffs also advanced numerous common law torts and statutory violations under District of Columbia law. All defendants have appeared except the Proud Boys and War Boys. Defendants have moved to dismiss all claims against them. They advance a host of arguments that, in the main, seek dismissal for lack of subject matter jurisdiction or for failure to state a claim. The parties have submitted extensive briefing on the range of constitutional, statutory, and common law issues. The court held a five-hour-long oral argument to consider them. After full deliberation over the parties' positions and the record, the court rules as follows. Number one. President Trump's motion to dismiss is denied as to plaintiff's 1985 claim and certain District of Columbia law claims and granted as to Swalwell's 1986 claim and certain District of Columbia claims. So his motion to dismiss for failure to act because of his role as the president was dismissed. Number two, Trump Jr.'s motion to dismiss is granted Three, Giuliani's motion to dismiss is granted. And four, the Oath Keeper's motion to dismiss is denied. And five, Tario's motion to dismiss is denied. Separately, Brooks has moved to substitute the United States as the proper party under the Westfall Act. The court declines to rule on that motion and instead invites Brooks to file a motion to dismiss, which the court will grant for the same reasons it has granted Trump Jr. and Giuliani's motions. All right, so there's our introduction, everybody. Uh, we already have the court acknowledging uh, what had happened that day and that there was harm done. So now the questions are, were there grounds to dismiss the case? They said with regards to John Jr. and to Giuliani, yes, there were grounds, but there were not grounds to dismiss uh, for President Trump listed here and the Oath Keepers as well as Tario. All right. Yes. Yeah, so just uh, the cases against Trump Jr. and Giuliani. And I'll take you through those two pieces, why the court dismissed. So there are there are rules. No viable evidence. No, that's not the grounds. All right, so let's get into the background then. Here are the facts alleged, all right? So again, I'm just kind of giving you the introduction here and then I will be skipping through and taking you through the legal arguments. Uh, facts alleged. This summary of alleged facts is drawn from the complaints in all three cases. So this is the appellate court uh, who's putting out the facts, okay? so. If you're saying, you know, what are the facts? This is the court's ruling on the facts. There's substantial overlap, but there are some differences. The court has not referenced every fact alleged across the three complaints. This factual recitation is meant to summarize the main allegations. Additionally, a citation to one complaint should not be understood to mean that the allegation is not present in other complaints. The court has limited the citations in the interest of efficiency. Additional facts will be referenced as appropriate in the discussion section. As required on a motion to dismiss, the court assumes these facts to be true, even if doubtful in fact. Uh, these are not the court's factual findings. Okay, well, I guess not. <laughs> I guess the court was saying these are not our factual findings. Typically, that's what this would mean, but apparently they're not. So let's highlight that here. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad they clarified that. <sighs> All right. 
So the weeks following the election, again, this is really just a couple of pages setting up what happened and then going into the procedural history of the case, and then we will get into the legal arguments. All right, false claims of uh, fraud and theft. President Trump began to sow the seeds of doubt about the validity of the November election in the weeks leading up to election day. Uh, he claimed, among other things, that there would be a fraud, that it was rigged, and his adversaries were trying to steal victory from him. On election night, the president claimed victory before all the votes were counted. He tweeted that they are trying to do this with this. We will never let them do it. He also would say in a primetime television address the next day, if you count these, I easily win. If you count the illegal ones, they can try to steal the this thing from us. And I am trying to be careful to not trigger that algorithm here. The president's allies joined him in making similar claims. For example, on November 5th, Brooks tweeted that he lacked faith that this was an honest Ellie. On November 6th, Trump Jr. tweeted that his father's campaign was uncovering evidence of this and that the media was creating false narratives that this was not real. On November 7th, one of uh, President Trump's um, which accounted for the president's loss in Pennsylvania. Efforts to influence state and local election officials. The president also took his case directly to state and local election officials. These meetings occurred by phone and in person, centered mostly in Georgia, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. In some instances, these efforts were followed by threatening words and conduct by some, support some supporters. In Georgia, for example, the president called Georgia Secretary of State an enemy of the people and tweeted about him over a dozen times. The secretary and his family were then targeted by some of the president's supporters with threats of violence and death. Another Georgia state official pleaded with the president to condemn the threats made to election workers in Georgia, but he refused to do so. In another instance in Michigan on December 5th, the president falsely declared that he had won almost every county in the state. The next day, armed protesters went to the home of Michigan's Secretary of State, demanding she overturn the election results. During these weeks, the president also tweeted criticism of the Republican governors in Arizona and Georgia, claiming that if they were with us, we would have already won both. During these efforts and aware of the threats directed against state election officials, the president tweeted, people are upset and they have a right to be. The president's allies, included Brooks and Giuliani, continued to support the president's campaign to undo the results. Brooks, for example, tweeted false claims that the president-elect Biden had not won in Georgia. He had also announced that he would object to certifying the electoral college ballots in Georgia. Giuliani also continued his efforts, falsely suggesting in mid-November that irregularities in Detroit were the reason for the president's loss. He asked then Deputy, Secret Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, Ken uh, Cuccinelli, to seize voting machines. The Trump campaign attorney even suggested that an election official should be this. C, the Stop the Steal rally. Dozens of protests sprung up around the country. Two in Washington, D.C. turned violent. On the evening of November 14th, multiple police officers were injured and nearly two dozen arrests were made. Then on December 12th, supporters of the president clashed with the District of Columbia police, injuring eight of them, which led to over 30 arrests, many for acts of assault. The president was aware of these rallies as he tweeted about them, and he would have known about the, the violence that accompanied them. Organized militia groups attended the events in Washington, D.C. One of them was the Proud Boys. During the pre-election debate, the moderator asked whether President Trump would denounce uh, white supremacist groups. When the president asked, why would you like me to condemn? Vice President Biden suggested the Proud Boys, to which the president responded, Proud Boys, stand back and stand by. Tario, the head of the Proud Boys, tweeted in response, standing by, sir. Another militia group that came to Washington, D.C. for those rallies was the Oath Keepers. 
on the December at the December rally, an Oath Keepers leader told the assembled crowd, "The president needs to know from you that you are with him, and that if he does not do it while he's commander in chief, we're going to have to do it ourselves later in a much more desperate, much more bloody war." So that's a lot, everybody. That's a lot. <laughs> okay. Again, we're giving the history here before we get into the arguments. Number two, preparations for the January 6th rally. On December 19th, President Trump announced, whoops, water break, sorry. <clears throat> on January, okay, on December 19th, President Trump announced that there would be a rally in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, the day of the certification of the Electoral College. Big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there, will be wild. The president and his campaign were involved in planning and funding the rally. He participated in selecting the speaker lineup in music, and his campaign made direct payments of $3.5 million to rally organizers. Good morning. Significantly, the rally was not permitted for a march from the ellipse the president and his campaign came up with the idea for a march to the Capitol. Pro-Trump message boards and social media lit up after the president's tweet announcing the January 6th rally. Some followers viewed the president's tweet as marching orders. One user posted referring to the president's debate statement to the Proud Boys standing by no longer. Other supporters explicitly contemplated storming the Capitol, and some posted about Occupy, Operation Occupy the Capitol or tweeted using the hashtag Occupy Capitals. <sighs> the president knew that his supporters had posted such messages. He and his advisors actively monitored the websites where his followers made these posts. News outlets, including Fox News, discussed them as well. On December 28th, in a widely publicized remarks, a former White House aide predicted there will be violence on January 6th because the president himself encourages it. Trump's allies also worked to promote the January 6th rally. Trump Jr. posted a video on Instagram asking his followers to be brave, do something. Giuliani tweeted a video purporting to explain how Vice President Mike Pence could block the certification of the election results. Brooks posted on social media on the eve of the rally that the president asked him to personally speak and tell the American people about the election system weaknesses that the socialist Democrats exploited to steal this election. At the same time, members of the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers began their preparations for the rally in earnest. On December 19th and 25th, leaders of the Oath Keepers announced that they had organized an alliance and orchestrated a plan with the Proud Boys. Terrio said the Proud Boys would turn out in record numbers. The groups also secured tactical and communications equipment. The Oath Keepers recruited additional members and prepared them with military-style training. Number three, January 6th, the riot at the Capitol building. The Save America rally on the ellipse began about 7 a.m. Brooks took the stage around 8.50 a.m. The congressman said, among other things, that we are, we are great because our ancestors sacrificed their blood, their sweat, and their tears, their fortunes, and sometimes their lives, and that today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. After Brooks finished, Giuliani spoke. He repeated that the election was this and said that it that it has to be vindicated to save our country. Then in the context of discussing how disputes over election fraud might be resolved, he proclaimed, proclaimed, let's have trial by combat. Trump Jr. gave the last speech before president, the president took the podium. He spent much of his remarks claiming that the Republican Party belongs to Donald Trump. He also warned Republican members of Congress, if you're going to be the zero and not the hero, we're coming for you and we're going to have a good time doing it. At about noon, President Trump took the stage. The court will discuss the president's speech in much greater detail later in this opinion, and I will be going through that analysis that is on the list. So recites only portions here. 
the president spoke for 75 minutes, and during that time, he pressed the false narrative of a this. He suggested the Vice President Pence could return Electoral College ballots to the states, allowing them to recertify electors, which would bring about an election victory. He urged rally goers to fight like hell and told them that you're allowed to go by very different rules when fraud occurs. Early in the speech, he referenced a march to the Capitol and said he knew the crowd would be going there to peacefully and patriotically make their voices heard. An hour later, he punctuated his speech by saying that the election lost, loss can't have happened. And we fight, we fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. He then directed his supporters to the Capitol. The crowd at various points responded, fight like hell, fight for Trump and other points storm the Capitol, invade the Capitol building, take the Capitol right now. Responding to the president's calls, thousands marched to the Capitol building after he finished his remarks. Okay. Meanwhile, Congress had convened a joint session at 1 p.m. to certify the Electoral College vote Outside the building, some supporters already had begun confrontations with Capitol Police, even before the president's speech had concluded. The Proud Boys, operating in small groups, had begun to breach the outer perimeter of the Capitol. The Ellipse crowd began to arrive by 1.30. As their numbers grew, the crowd overwhelmed police and exterior barriers and entered the Capitol at 2.12 p.m. The Oath Keepers were among the crowd. The joint session was suspended and the vice president and members of Congress were evacuated. Public officers, including the blessing game plaintiffs, were injured as violent confrontations continued with the president's supporters. All right. Number four, the president's response. After his speech, the president returned to the White House and watched the events at the Capitol unfold on television. Despite pleas from advisors and congressmen, the president did not immediately call on his supporters to leave the Capitol building. At about 2.24 p.m., after rioters had entered the Capitol, he sent a tweet critical of the vice president for lacking the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution. Eventually, two hours later, the president would tell his supporters to stand down. He tweeted a video calling on them to go home. We love you. You're very special. The president sent one more tweet that day after police had cleared the Capitol around 6 p.m. The president said, these are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide <sighs> sacred landslide victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Remember this day forever. The House of Representatives would later pass a single article of impeachment accusing President Trump of inciting an insurrection, but the Senate would acquit him after he left office. All right, so there we go. There is the uh, summary of what occurred there. So uh, the next piece will be the procedural history. So again, a lot of people don't realize we still have these civil lawsuits continuing on. There are five of them bundled together and they are ongoing. They still are in front of the courts. So this next piece will take you through the details of each case. And there's about three paragraphs per case describing uh, what the content of each case is, so each lawsuit. These are all separate, but kind of bundled together. If it weren't so horrific, you'd laugh. I agree, it was pretty horrific. Uh, and the description of it, every time I read the description of it, it again, it's, it's overwhelming. <sighs> um, okay, so here we go. We'll start with the Thompson v. Trump case. Again, I'm taking you through these just to tell you about these lawsuits, and then we will get into the analysis. The Thompson case was the first to come before the court on February 16th of 2021. The plaintiffs in that case are 10 members of the House of Representatives. So here's the footnote. Let's bump down and see who they are. The plaintiffs are Representative Karen Bass, uh, Stephen Cohen, Veronica Escobar, Pamela Jayapal, Henry Johnson, Marsha Kaptur, 
Barbara Lee, uh, Jared Nadler, Maxine Waters, and Bonnie Coleman. All right, so those are our representatives who are bringing the case. Although the case is captioned Thompson v. Trump, the court will refer to these plaintiffs as the Bass plaintiffs after the second named plaintiff, Representative Karen Bass, because the lead plaintiff, Representative Benny Thompson, voluntarily dismissed his claim after his appointment to serve as the chair of the Select Kitty Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. All right, so he voluntarily dismissed his claim because he was appointed uh, to the select committee investigating it. All right. Although we are elected officials, although all are elected officials, the Bass plaintiffs have filed suit in their personal capacities. The Bass plaintiffs have named six defendants, President Trump, Giuliani, the Oath Keepers, Proud Boys International, War Boys, and Tario. They assert a single claim against all defendants, a violation of 42 United States Code 1985. All defendants except the Proud Boys and the War Boys have appeared and moved to dismiss the claim against them. Citing the uh, dismissals. All right, so that's the first case. So we've got the first case are going to be referred to as the Bass Plaintiffs. All right, so then we get into the second case. Yep, take a drink. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Swalwell versus Trump. Representative Eric Swalwell filed his action on March 5th of 2021. Also in his personal capacity, he, he named as defendants President Trump, Trump Jr., Brooks, and Giuliani. His complaint advances a host of federal and District of Columbia law claims against all defendants. Number one, a violation of the 1985 uh, one a violation of 42 U.S. Code 1986, two counts of negligence per se predicate, predicated on violations of the District of Columbia anti-rioting and disorderly conduct criminal statutes, four, a violation of District of Columbia anti-bias statute, five, intentional infliction of emotional distress, six, negligent infliction of emotional distress, seven, aiding and abetting common law assault, and eight, negligence. Each defendant, except Brooks, has moved to dismiss all claims against him. Uh, citing here, Brooks has moved for a scope of office certification under the Westfall Act, uh, claiming uh, that Mo Brooks was acting within the scope of his office or employment. Under the Westfall Act, if the Attorney General certifies that a tort claim against the employee of a government, including a member of Congress, arises from Congress from conduct performed while acting within the scope of his office or employment, the United States is to be substituted as the defendant. Brooks asked the Attorney General for a Westfall Act certification, but he declined to but he declined to request. So um, notwithstanding the Attorney General's denial. So his request under the Westfall Act was denied, all right? The Attorney General's denial, the Westfall Act, authorizes a court to make the requisite certification. Brooks seeks such relief from the courts. So that's claim number two, is the Brooks claim, all right? Uh, number three, Blassingame v. Trump. The third action is brought by James Blassingame and Sidney Hemby, two Capitol Police officers who were on duty and injured on January 6th. They name only President Trump as the defendant. They advance numerous federal and District of Columbia law claims. One, directing assault and battery. Two, aiding and abetting assault and battery. Three, directing intentional infliction of emotional distress. Four, two counts of negligence per se predicated on violations of District of Columbia anti-rioting and disorderly conduct criminal statutes. Five, punitive damages. Six, violation of 1985 subsection one. And seven, civil conspiracy and violation of common law. Defendant Trump has moved to dismiss all counts against him. 
And then four, all right, so this is the um, blasting game here. And that is uh, the officers, all right? So we can kind of remember who's, who's doing what. Number four, the motions to dismiss. Defendants' arguments for dismissal are the same across all three cases. They're claiming, one, that the plaintiffs lack standing to sue under Article 3 of the Constitution. Two, the First Amendment bars plaintiffs' claims. And three, plaintiffs have failed to state a claim upon which 1985 and District of Columbia law would apply. President Trump advances a number of contentions that are specific to him. One, he's absolutely immune from suit. Two, the political question doctrine renders these cases non-justiciable. And three, the impeachment judgment clause bars civil suits against a government official like him acquitted following impeachment. And four, the doctrines of res judicata and collateral estoppel premised on his acquittal by the Senate preclude all plaintiff's claims. Now, I'm not going to go through every single claims analysis because it, it you know it would just take too long. So let me give you a, a brief summary here. First is this absolute immunity, and I will go into this one again, talking about that Nixon v. Fitzgerald case and whether or not um, inciting violence through speech is covered, and we've already discussed that. No, it's not. The political question doctrine, um, and that's uh, not an issue either. The impeachment judgment clause, we talked about that before, where he's claiming that because he was impeached but not convicted, you can't bring suits against him because of the language. Uh, that's the impeachment judgment piece. Uh, the doctrines of raised judicata and collateral estoppel. Raised judicata means your case has already been decided. And collateral estoppel means uh, if your case has already had a decision done, then you can't bring it again, right? So that's what he's claiming here. He's claiming these issues were all resolved through the impeachment process, and he was found not guilty by the Senate, essentially. All right, so those are the big arguments. I will go into the First Amendment issue and the presidential immunity. Next, we have uh, the discussion. So I will kind of just summarize the next bits until we get into uh, kind of the bigger points here. What does defines inciting violence through speech? What defines it? Right. So uh, I'm glad you asked. And uh, I will go into that. I will go into that. Let me give you. Um, let me write this down here. So under the First Amendment, we have a test called the Brandenburg test. And under Brandenburg, we have what incitement is. So the incitement test is set out by Brandenburg. It's also followed up by another case called NAACP versus the hardware store. But the Brandenburg test is where we get uh, this, this verbiage of inciting violence. So I will go into that in just a little bit. The court does uh, talk about that. So... This was actually one of the first uh, lives I did way, way long ago was trying to explain uh, the Brandenburg test. So we will get into that for sure. Right, right. Well, we'll just, we'll take a look and see what the court has to say about that. So let me summarize some of the discussion here and then I'll get further into the details. So here we've got two subparts in discussion whether the court has subject matter jurisdiction, and two, whether the plaintiffs have stated uh, cognizable claims. So the first is the subject matter jurisdiction, and so the court goes into uh, whether or not they have subject matter jurisdiction. Article three of the United States Constitution sets out jurisdiction for our federal courts. So that's what this analysis is. Also talking about having standing to bring the lawsuit, uh, that analysis is done uh, pretty significantly here. What are the elements of standing? I will take a moment to talk about that. The most important case ever, everybody, <laughs> regarding standing to bring a lawsuit is coming from the Lujan versus the Defenders of Wildlife case. This case is critical. This is If you want to know what standing is, it's this case. So you have to have three pieces, injury in fact, causation, and redressability. Those are what's required in order to bring a lawsuit. If you don't have 
uh, all three of these pieces uh, to the Lujan test, then you may not bring a lawsuit. So a lot of people think anybody can bring a lawsuit for anything. It's not true. You actually have to have standing. So uh, here's the Lujan test, and they do go through that here uh, as well. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. This is the court setting out here the historical context of having standing to sue, going through all of the elements and supportive case law. Again, you know, under Article 3 sets out our federal courts. So the court is explaining that and then even coming back in again with that Lujan standing test. Now, next we have B, legislator standing. So um, they're saying here, do the legislators, the representatives who are suing, do they have standing? And so they go through that analysis again, explaining that. So they do spend some time on that, but I will be skipping through that. So um, I am getting on to the next point here. All right, so let's do get into the presidential immunity question. I think that it's really important because we're going to be continuing to hear a lot about it. So let me take you through this particular analysis. More coffee. <laughs> More coffee, everybody. <laughs> okay, presidential immunity. The court turns next to the question of presidential immunity. President Trump contends that under the Supreme Court's decision in Nixon v. Fitzgerald, he's absolutely immune from damages, liability in all three cases because his alleged conduct falls within the outer perimeter of his official presidential responsibilities. This is not an easy issue. It's one that implicates fundamental norms of separation of power and calls on the court to assess the limits of a president's functions and historical examples to serve as guideposts are few. After careful consideration, the court concludes that on the facts alleged, absolute immunity does not shield President Trump from suit, except as to Swalwell's 1986 failure to act claim. All right, that's the key holding for presidential immunity here. All right, so uh, what the court here is saying is presidential immunity does not protect him from being sued except for one of the claims where one of the petitioners was saying his failure to act was a violation of their rights. All right, so that is the only piece that is protected because he said, you know, you're the president, you should have done something to stop it after it had started and the case law just doesn't support that. Not in his job description. Yep. <laughs> All right. So there we go. Uh, the scope of a president's absolute immunity against damages liability. So the court's discussion naturally begins with the Supreme Court's decision in Nixon v. Fitzgerald. In that case, a former federal employee sued President Richard Nixon and various executive branch officers, officials, for damages arising from his termination from employment. The plaintiff claimed that President Nixon was directly involved in his firing and that the action was undertaken in retaliation for his having publicly revealed during congressional hearings cost overruns in the Department of the Air Force. The plaintiff asserted two statutory claims, one under the First Amendment, uh, who by that point was no longer president, after the D.C. Circuit declined to dismiss the case on the grounds of absolute presidential immunity, Supreme Court took up the question of the scope of immunity available to a president of the United States. So here is the holding in the Nixon case, all right, the Nixon v. Fitzgerald case, which is a triggering case for me. It drives me bonkers. The court held that President Nixon enjoyed absolute immunity from the plaintiff's suit. We hold that petitioner as former president of the United States is entitled to absolve absolute immunity from damages liabilities predicated on his official acts. So again, the key is official acts. All right. The court continued, we consider this immunity a functionally mandated incident of the president's unique office rooted in the constitutional tradition of the separations of power central to the court's determination was the unique position in the constitutional scheme that the president occupies. The court observes that as the chief constitutional officer of the executive branch, the president is entrusted with supervisory and policy responsibilities of the utmost discretion and sensitivities. 
So they go on again to do more of that analysis. Now, I'm not going to get into the super detailed pieces of that analysis because I don't think it's necessary to really understand how the court came to its holding. But what they're doing is they're distinguishing the Fitzgerald case here, um, talking about how it was an employee, uh, you know, an employee that said I was wrongfully terminated. And that's a little bit different situation than the harm that was done in this case. So... Fitzgerald thus established a scope of presidential immunity for civil money damages that is unquestionably uh, capricious, though not categorical. The Supreme Court contemplated that, at least. There might be some actions by a president that would fall outside the outer perimeter of his official responsibilities and expose him to civil lawsuit. What lay beyond the outer perimeter would come into focus 15 years later in the Clinton v. Jones case. This again, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about this before, is absolutely essential. You cannot do a Nixon v. Fitzgerald analysis without including Clinton v. Jones in that analysis. It just can't be done. It just cannot be done. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's a conclusion that is just what it is. <laughs> All right, so here's a quick overview of Clinton v. Jones. There, President Bill Clinton, while in office, faced a suit by Paula Jones that, in the main, alleged that he engaged in inappropriate conduct while he was governor of Arkansas and had retaliated against her for rebuffing his advances. Such acts, the court said, were unrelated to any of his official duties as president of the United States and indeed occurred before he was elected to that office. President Clinton nevertheless urged the court to hold that the Constitution affords the president temporary immunity from civil damages litigation arising out of events that occurred before he took office. The court rejected the president's call for temporary immunity. So that's so important to note that. The court knocked Clinton back and said, no, sir, there's accountability here and you need to come to court. All right. It reasoned that the principal rationale for affording certain public service servants absolute immunity was to enable such officials to perform their designated functions effectively without... Uh, please define the outer perimeter. Right. Well, that's what, this that's what this whole thing's all about, is what is the outer perimeter? So the outer perimeter is what's discussed in the Fitzgerald, in the Nixon v. Fitzgerald case, but then also within Clinton. So what they're saying right here is they're saying, you know, his comments to Paula Jones at the time they were made were not part of the outer perimeter of his job as president. All right, so this is giving you an example. What he did was not under uh, the perimeter or under the job description as president. All right, so this is one example. But the only way to truly define the outer perimeter is to go through the analysis and say, what are uh, the job descriptions of the president? What's included in his or her role? So that's what the court goes into further here. All right, so uh, it reasoned the principal rationale again for certain public service immunity was to enable such officials to perform their designated functions effectively without fear. Uh, so they went in and explained further the scope of immunity um, needs to make it so he can do his job or her job. Um, and then the court then defined the scope of the president's absolute immunity and it observed that the sphere of protected action must be related closely to the immunities justifying purposes. All right, so that's really that's really the whole test. So that Fitzgerald case that's saying there's absolute immunity, Clinton v. Jones is saying that immunity only is protected uh, if those actions are closely related to the justifying purpose for that immunity. All right, so again, the outer limits, meaning the job description of the president, in, which could be seen as pretty extensive, but you still need to look to the intent for the reason why the immunity was given to begin with. Have a sort of immunity, where did this begin? Yeah, so qualified immunity um, in a lot of our public servants, it actually goes all the way back to um, the original drafting of the Constitution under Article 2, hold on here, Article 1, sorry, hold on, where's my 
Constitution. So under, under Article 1, hold on. Again, don't tell my professor that my Constitution is all messed up like this. <laughs> but let me show you what I'm talking about here. Oh, here we go. Sorry, this is an abomination of our Constitution. My bad. Uh, hold on here, just a moment. Oops. Oops, I'm out of order again. I'm out of order, I'm all out of order, everybody. It's, it's morning time, my Constitution's a mess. <laughs> Ugh, where's the rest of Article 2? Where'd you go? Or Article 1? Hold on, hold on. All right, well, it's a mess. <laughs> Just a minute. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, I am a terrible constitutional law teacher with my constitution in such a mess. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> right. Oh, here we go. Nope, that's not it. Well, where did I put the rest of Article 2? All right, hold on, everybody. One moment. Sorry, I don't know where the rest of Article 1 went, <laughs> so let me show you in this format here. Um, Article 1, here we go, which sets it out. Um, let's make sure here. Mm -hmm. um, judging elections. Compensation. Um, hold on. Let's see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Hold on. I missed it. Just a second. Here we go. All right, here it is. So Article 1, Section 6, all right, which sets out Congress. They shall in all cases except treason, felony, and breach of peace be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses and in going to and returning from the same and for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. So the original set of immunity set out for our government people was set out in Article one. Oh, am I getting reported? Oh no. Oh, just piles of, yes, my constitution collect. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just don't forget. We also have a Spanish version. If anyone needs it, I've got a French version. <laughs> yes, it's okay. Yeah. It was lagging again. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> I'm being very careful with my language. Oh, yes. Yes, I have several. <laughs> All right. So uh, the qualified immunity question, again, it's been set out by case law, but it was originally set out in Article 1 when it came to Congress and whether or not they would be protected from what they needed to do. So that's really where it started here. Oh, All right. So... 
Let's keep moving on here. We've got the continuation of the analysis for the Clinton case here, and then also explaining how Clinton separates the case from the Fitzgerald case as well. Uh, next, next subsection we have is the party's positions on official acts immunity. So we've got, again, I'll just summarize these next few pieces because I want to get to the First Amendment discussion. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, you know, am I in frame, everybody? Let me just double check here. Let me double check. Am I too high in the frame? I can't quite see on my screen. Let me just double check before I get back into it. Yes, you're... Yes, well, <laughs> okay, it's okay, it's okay, okay, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. All right, so let me, again, uh, I wanted to go through the immunity question, so we've discussed that, and next I will go through just summarizing what the defendant's claims are before uh, getting into the next legal analysis. So uh, the next claim, so the first one is they're saying absolute presidential immunity, the court held, no, that's not true, that's not applicable. Next, the party's positions on official acts immunities. So again, uh, the court setting out Trump bears the burden of establishing he's immune from suit under the law. That's his next argument here. The court finds that um, the defendants take care clause arguments misleading and wrong as a matter of law. So I'm not even going to go through the analysis because the analysis is false. Uh, next, the take care clause. So this piece was another one I did want to show out, uh, to take out and show you because it has to do with the electoral college. So let's talk about the role the president plays in the electoral college. All right, Article 2, Section 3, vests in the president the authority to take care that the laws will be faithfully executed. Those are sweeping words, but do not confer limitless presidential authority or the authority to encroach on the powers vested in co-equal branches. Now, we're citing the Youngstown Sheet case. Now, this case, again, was where President Truman saw that the steel workers were going to start uh, striking. And he said, you can't, and made an executive order that prohibited them from going on strike because it would negatively affect the Korean War that was going on at the time. So he said, you can't do it. Now the US Supreme Court came in in this Youngstown sheet case and said, President Truman, you're overstepping your authority. Uh, if they want to strike, they can strike and you are not allowed to have um, you're not allowed to put an executive order in to do that for private industry. All right, that's the Youngstown case. So limitations on presidential power is the key here to this case. Presidential authority remains constrained by the Constitution and the laws that Congress enacts. So we've got to keep that in mind. Again, they're quoting the Youngstown case. So we're using that precedent to go into uh, here whether or not uh, these acts are covered or, yes, uh, are covered or not. So the court holds here, uh, Trump cites no constitutional provision or federal statute that grants or vests, oops, <laughs> in the president or executive branch any power or duty with respect to the certification of the Electoral College vote, at least in the manner in which he conceived it, that is because there is none. So the defendant's next argument was that because he needs to faithfully uh, watch over the laws, that he could be involved with the Electoral College certification. And what the court here is saying, no, it doesn't say that in the Constitution, and there's no law to support that theory at all. The Constitution spells out the respective responsibilities of various actors in the election of the president. The Constitution provides that the states are to select electors who will cast votes for the president and vice president, 
and the electors transmit a tally of those votes to the President of the Senate, citing Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3, as amended by the 12th Amendment. The President of the Senate, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, shall open all certificates of the votes and shall be counted. Again, um, this is artic- this is the twelfth amendment. A sitting president is prescribed no role. So that is the key holding. Again, the president has no role in the electoral college. There's there's no job for the president in that area. Next, we have the electoral count act. I'm going through this because I think it's really important to understand what happened when it came to this alternate slate of electors. There, there is no alternate slate of electors, and that's according to the Constitution and next, the Electoral Count Act. So the Electoral Count Act fills in procedural details not addressed in the Constitution. It, too, prescribes no role for a sitting president. A joint session of the Senate and House of Representatives must meet at the hour of 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the 6th day of January, succeeding every meeting of the electors. The president of the Senate, as the prescribing or presiding office officer, opens the certificates of electoral votes and hands them to tellers appointed to each house who make a list of the votes. When announcing each certificate, the president of the Senate calls for objections, which, if made, must be in writing and signed by one senator and a member of the House of Representatives. Thereafter, the Senate and the House withdraw to their respective chambers to consider each objection, and each senator and representative may speak to such objection or question five minutes, and not more than once. The presiding officer must cut the debate off after two hours. See, even back when they were writing this, they knew they talked too much. (laughs) He also has the power to preserve order during the session. The act even details where the presiding officer, the speaker, the senators, the representatives, the tellers, and others are to sit in the chamber. And it commands that the session not be dissolved until the count of electoral votes shall be completed and the result declared. As this summary demonstrates, a sitting president has no expressly identified duty to faithfully execute the laws surrounding the certification of the Electoral College. So again, this is another key piece. All right. Sitting president has no expressed identified duty regarding it. All right. So that supports the argument. If the documents that were found in the are connected to what? What? (laughs) Connected to Israel? Well, that's way off into the future. That's way off. Uh, It's too soon for that question. It's a great question, but it's too soon for that question with the situation in Israel. All right. So the court's saying here, again, the president has no role in the electoral college situation. So perhaps it's not surprising that President Trump does not identify any law relating to the certification that he was purportedly executing through his tweets and the January 6th rally speech. Again, this is an essential holding here as well. There is no law to support what they're saying regarding the alternate slates in his job with the Electoral College. There's absolutely no law anywhere to support that at all. All right, so that's really important to remember as well. So I'll just highlight that, and then we will move on from the Electoral College, all right? The president has no role in the Electoral College or in the electors, so he cannot direct a slate of alternate electors because it's, there's no law that allows for that. Never stopped him before. <laughs> Frank, come on. <laughs> Good point. All right, let's move on then. We've talked about the Electoral College. Uh, The president has no role. So next, they go into the analysis of a speech on matters of public concern. So President Trump's assertion, his alleged actions involve speech on matters of public concern. Um, Here, the court agrees in two respects. First, the speech unquestionably critical of the function of the presidency, right? But then... The court goes in on the next page. 
But to say that speaking on matters of public concern is a function of the presidency does not answer the question at hand. Were President Trump's words in this case uttered in performance of official duties or were his words expressed in some other official capacity? That's the question that has to be answered regarding the content of his words. All right. So that's the other essential piece. Um, and then they go into the defendant's analysis on uh, his perspective and some examples of his perspective uh, as well. Now I'm going to skip through most of this analysis again. Uh, if you are wanting the super detailed details of this case, you know, it's, it's available online uh, here. But um, the court is saying at the very end that the plaintiff's position runs against the court's admonition of that test. So basically, you know, uh, Trump is saying I'm protected because it's part of the uh, public concern. The test he's using to determine public concern, the court says, does not apply. It's not an appropriate test in this case. So no, it's not a matter of public concern. That's what that analysis is in a nutshell. And then the president's challenged acts uh, offered here as well. Um, I won't go through that analysis too much either because it's uh, just another technical piece of it that kind of sets up the First Amendment argument, which is really what I want to get into. Uh, next, they go into the Section 1986 claim. So again, this is that question of saying, as the president, you should have come in and done something to stop it. And the case law just does not support that. Uh, here, they hold in this case, the president cannot be held liable for his failure to exercise his presidential powers at least under the 1986 section of the Civil Rights Act. So uh, next we have the political question doctrine. This is another piece that was raised by the defendant saying the case should be dismissed because there's no political question. Uh, in order for certain cases to be uh, in certain jurisdictions, you have to have certain requirements and that's, uh, they go through the analysis here. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time on this either because the analysis is incorrect. Uh, the analysis from the defendants. Next, we have the impeachment judgment clause. So defendants are claiming I was already held accountable because of the impeachment and I was found not guilty. So because of that, I shouldn't be brought in front of uh, a court again. I can't be sued for the same things I was impeached for. That was the premise here uh, under the impeachment clause argument. And the court said, um, the court therefore draws no negative implication from the words of the impeachment judgment clause that would bear that would bar civil liability a president acquitted uh, following impeachment. So what the court is saying is here is just because you're impeached doesn't mean you can't be held civilly liable. All right. The next argument, of course, is to say, well, we've got raised judicata, which means once we have a final decision in a court, that is the final decision. And he's saying, I had a final decision in Congress. That is the final decision, which let me pause for a moment. Isn't it interesting? Just take a moment here. Isn't it interesting how they say um, the finding of impeachment in the House that he was uh, impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors for the insurrection? That was what they found in the House. But then the Senate did not convict of that. So they're saying, but the conviction, the not conviction is the final word, but yet the findings in the house are not considered. They're like, the findings in the house don't matter. The only thing that matters is the finding in the Senate, which I think is a false narrative here. So, all right, so here we go, uh, moving on. So race judicata does not prevent and in here, you can't be precluded from a lawsuit when you don't have a final uh, judicial judgment as well. So they go through here um, talking again about those pieces. Neither raised judicata nor collateral estoppel bars these suits or precludes litigation of any issue or fact. So that's the ultimate holding on that last issue. All right. So again, I'm just kind of summarizing this uh, for a few more pages until we get to that First Amendment argument. 
Is Jeopardy from a criminal viewpoint attached during the Senate trial? No, no, it's not. It's not because it's not a uh, proper jurisdiction. So you don't have that kind of a conviction is just a very special situation. It's not seen as a judicial conviction and therefore does not count towards double jeopardy or towards estoppel or raised judicata. And that's what they're explaining here. Uh, next, we've got failure to state a 1985 claim. And I'm not going to go into the details of that because, you know, that's pretty boring. <laughs> Talking again about standing, do they have standing to bring a suit of violations of their rights? And the court kind of goes into that explanation again here, um, citing case law and the act itself. Um, so uh, the court's saying, here we go. The court therefore finds that members of Congress plainly are within the 1985 zone of interest. So yes, they can bring uh, a lawsuit. Next, whether the plaintiffs are covered federal officials under 1985. So we've got another analysis here on that. And they're saying here, um, yes, damages are allowable. Number three, whether members of Congress were discharging a duty on January 6th. And, you know, yes, they were discharging a duty going through, clearly, uh, the pleading of conspiracy. So now there's this question of uh, the conspiracy elements. Again, the court goes through what conspiracy is at a civil level, uh, explaining, you know, again, you have to have two or more people with a plan, with an intent involved, uh, and then setting out the conspiracy elements as well. So that's all of the defendant's points for trying to have the case dismissed. All right. So each of those points, some are stronger than others, but all of them are weak. <laughs> Hence why uh, most of this case was not dismissed. All right. Next, then we have the plaintiff's allegations. So I'll just, again, kind of summarize what um, the plaintiffs are alleging was the harm here, all right? I'll probably just go through the first paragraph and then kind of breeze through the rest. According to the plaintiffs, in the months leading up to January 6th, um, this guy and his allies created the conditions that, that would enable the violence that happened that day. The president's role during this period was multifaceted, included regularly issuing false tweets, insisting, among other things, the elections in those states and so on. Again, I'm not going to trigger any of that language again, but they're going in and saying there was harm done because of the language that he used. All right. And there's a lot of uh, inciting language. So I'm going to skip again through that. Uh, the plaintiff's petitions are also available online. You can read through um, their specific claims about the harm that was done to them. I'm not going to spend much time on that. Again, I don't want to trigger any words here. So they go through that. Again, this is the plaintiff's uh, harm that they believe occurred. Um, next, we have this conspiracy issue again. So viewing the foregoing well-pleaded facts in the light most favorable to the plaintiffs and drawing all reasonable inferences in favor of uh, this particular case, the court concludes that the complaints establish a plausible 1985 conspiracy involving President Trump. So ultimately, they believe that the plaintiffs have grounds to bring their lawsuit uh, even a conspiracy element to their lawsuit. The key is that the conspirators share the same general conspiratorial objective of a single plan, the essential nature and general scope of which is known to all conspirators. So again, we have this question of the conspiracy and it's the plan itself that's the charge. Uh, whether or not they were successful is not uh, the key to a conspiracy claim. A conspiracy claim is based off of this plan and overt acts to go forward. So let's talk about Giuliani and Donald Trump Jr. They were dismissed from these cases. So uh, we'll go into Giuliani first. All right. First, the court reaches a different conclusion as to Giuliani. There's little doubt plaintiffs have adequately pleaded that Giuliani was involved in a conspiracy to engage. 
But as the court stated earlier, such a conspiracy does not violate the 1983 subsection one. What plaintiffs must plausibly establish is that Giuliani conspired to prevent Congress from discharging the duties on January 6th by force, intimidation, or threat. There they fall short. So Giuliani's been dismissed from the case because they could not show uh, he was an essential player in the conspiracy. All right, so he was dismissed. Also, we have Trump Jr. We have a similar uh, analysis as well. The court reaches the same conclusions as to Trump Jr. The allegations against him are even thinner than those against Giuliani. And uh, before the 6th, and then they're talking about the tweets that he did, also him speaking at the rally. But they are insufficient to make him a co-conspirator in the plan to disrupt Congress. All right, so Giuliani and Don Jr. are out because they were not uh, interwoven enough or included enough within the conspiracy uh, t for the Congress. All right. So those those two are out. But yet with the Oath Keepers and Tario, they are still in. So let's look and see what they said. Uh, so they are also challenging the sufficiency of the conspiracy. But the plaintiffs, however, have pleaded sufficient facts to establish race bond deed superior liability at this stage. Race bond deed superior means agents acting on behalf of their boss. So for the Oath Keepers and the people that were involved there, they did show they were involved in the conspiracy enough to keep them in the case. And so they've been kept in. Also, we've got Tario in his role. Um, and they, again, the court held that the allegations are sufficient, again, to plausibly establish Tario as a conspirator. So he's included in the conspiracy as well. So he is also remaining in the lawsuit. Agents for the boss. Yep. To sum it up, the court holds that plaintiffs have successfully pleaded a 1985 sub one conspiracy claim against Trump, the Oath Keepers and Tario. They have fallen short as to Giuliani and Trump Jr. So those two have been bumped out of the lawsuit. All right. So next we've got failure to state the claim again. We've kind of already talked about that. And then next we've got the First Amendment defense. So that will really be the next and final piece that I will be spending time on. And then I'll go through the court's actual order. So let me explain the First Amendment discussion here. All right. So there have been lots of discussions and there will continue to be lots of discussions about, you know, the First Amendment freedom of speech. So Everything that was said is covered by freedom of speech. But here's here's the deal. Under freedom of speech, freedom of speech is not an absolute right, which means there are some restrictions. Probably the most common, well-known restriction is defamation, which all of these people have been sued for repeatedly on defamation. Giuliani's been sued. Um, Fox has been sued. The My Pillow guy has been sued. Everybody's getting sued all the time for defamation because defamation is not protected by the First Amendment. All right. Other things like obscenities not protected, fighting words and incitement is not protected. So because of that, you can't claim uh, my speech is OK. I can say whatever I want because it's freedom of speech. There are some restrictions. You just can't use certain words in certain ways and uh, not be held accountable for it, all right? So he goes by Lumpy Pillow Guy. <laughs> Can you repeat that, please? Sure, sure. So under the First Amendment, no, I, I mean, again, no right is absolute. Under the First Amendment, we have a few primary uh, restrictions. Let me just, let me write them out here. These kinds of speech are not protected. First is defamation. Defamation is not protected by the First Amendment. So you can be sued for defamation. The First Amendment does not apply to defamation. Number two, anything that is seen as obscene is not protected by the First Amendment. That's under the Miller test. All right. So if it's deemed obscene, it's not protected by the First Amendment. You can be sued. You can be prosecuted. That's the next piece. The next uh, set of words is, it's a bit, this area is a little bit more gray, but we call it fighting words, 
All right, so words that you know are going to incite someone to violence is one piece of it. Fighting words, and then we have another part of that called clear and present danger. Present danger. Clear and present danger would be like shouting um, fire in a crowded room, all right? These are not protected by the First Amendment. So if you use this kind of speech, you can get charged. You can get sued for it because it's not protected by the First Amendment. And what's the key to this case is the incitement test. Words that you use to incite violence, imminent lawless actions are not protected by freedom of speech under the Brandenburg test. All right. Clear and present danger, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing, it's a thing. So these are the uh, exceptions to freedom of speech right here. Now, you might say, I thought all of our amendments or all of our rights were absolute. Well, they're just, they're not. They're just not, everybody. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be the person to tell you that, but they're not. The best example that I always give to my students when it comes to absolute rights of constitutional rights, the number one example is under freedom of religion, you can only marry one person. All right, this is the best example I can give you that no right is absolute. So if your religion says you need to marry multiple people, that's too bad. You're only allowed to marry one person. Why? Because it gets complicated for the taxes. All right, <laughs> so if your religion says you have to marry multiple people, that's just too bad. The U.S. Supreme Court has said you are only allowed to marry one person legally. You can have as many spouses as you want, but legally you can only marry one. I get it. Maybe that goes against your religion, but that's too bad. Freedom of religion is not absolute. All right? That's the example I always give. Can you explain number four? What's an example of that? Oh, sure. Uh, clear and present danger. So... Um, Right. If you the the best one was given by Oliver Wendell Holmes, and the example he gave is if you're in a crowded theater and you yell fire, even though there is no fire, so you are presenting a clear and present danger to uh, society, to the people in the room, because of the language that you're using. So you are setting them into a path of danger because of your language. So that's what clear and present danger means. So if you've got a huge mob, right, and you say words that are making them scramble away or go forward towards mob violence, that would be clear and present danger. So if you say, you know, there's a dinosaur coming after you and everybody runs away and people get trampled and, and homicided, you know, you can be held responsible for saying there's a dinosaur coming because you created that present danger that harmed other people just by using your words. Okay. Yeah, the dinosaur. I, I don't know why I came up with dinosaur. I'm still not fully caffeinated, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that. What does number two say? So obscene, obscene materials. So if you're, um, if you have material or speech that's obscene, and if it's obscene, it will depend on the Miller test. It's a three-part test, so it's appealing to the prurient interest. It lacks any scientific or educational value. Um, and that's the intent, then you uh, are not going to be able to have that language out, all right? So usually obscenity applies when the government passes a law saying certain kinds of language can't be used or uh, certain kinds of visual depictions are not allowed. Usually the government will pass those kinds of restrictions, and then when those laws are challenged, they uh, will challenge it under the obscenity rule. Mm-hmm. When you know you see it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We're not exactly sure what it is, but we know it when we see it. And that's a big piece. And, you know, probably one of the most famous examples was, um, well, I can't really go into it. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Oh, sorry, I can't really get into the details here. But <laughs> obscenity has uh, is not protected. Again, if you ha are appealing to the prurient interest and there's no value to it outside of the prurient interest, then you uh, can't, your content can't be pulled for being obscene. All right? <laughs> yes, three and four go hand in hand. The only reason I separate them out is because they're different cases. 
All right, we have different cases on fighting words. Uh, the most famous case involved, um, so there was a man who was out talking about his religion and he was kind of stirring up the community and an officer came over and said, hey, you're stirring up the community. And then the guy said a whole bunch of bad words and called that officer some really bad language. <laughs> And so the officer was like, wow, <laughs> you can't say that to me. And he arrested him. And they, he said, well, I can say whatever I want to you because, you know, I've got freedom of speech. And the Supreme Court came back and said, you can't just say language you know is going to make another person so upset that they're unable to control themselves and they get angry. So that's the case for fighting words. Meanwhile, with clear and present danger, again, it's kind of setting up this idea of the community being in danger because of the words you're using. This came off of a case involving... Um, the draft requirements and handing out pamphlets. So they're just two different cases. So they're two different standards, but both of these are kind of gray areas and both of them are really overruled or pushed together by the Brandenburg test. You have the Miller test. <laughs> oh, the Miller test. <laughs> Yes, yes, you got it, you got it. All right, so it's not protected. That's that's the whole point. And this is just a basic fundamental piece of constitutional law that you know we teach about that is important for everyone to know. And that's what the court is going into here. Uh, they're going into how the First Amendment does not protect certain kinds of speech. So that's the analysis here. Now, I've been talking about the Brandenburg test, right? And I'll get into that a little bit more here. Brandenburg test on inciting imminent lawless action. This is part one of the test. The second case when it comes to imminent lawless action is the hardware case, all right? So the NAACP case, um, this, this is another one. So both the Brandenburg and the NAACP, those cases together establish the incitement test. So if you're inciting someone to violence, that language is not protected by the First Amendment. All right, so that's really what the... Uh, I could go through a whole live doing the First Amendment. I really could. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of intricacies to it. So the court is going through and explaining again uh, these tests that they use when it comes to inciting um, here, uh, participating in an unlawful conspiracy again is set out as well. Let me uh, take you specifically, though, to the Brandenburg test. So this is the other piece that I wanted to uh, show you, to share with you today, and then I'll get into the final orders here of the court. So let's talk about Brandenburg then and incitement. This was a huge issue um, when it came to the language that he was using. So a trio, trio of Supreme Court cases has come to define the incitement exception to the First Amendment again. Inciting words are not protected, so you can be charged. They are the Brandenburg test, uh, the Hess, and the hardware test. A brief discussion of each helps to frame the determination this court must make. So the Brandenburg case, um, here, I'm going to kind of skip this language. I need to be careful about this. There was a member of the Klan who was charged with criminal syndicalism because there was he was at a rally and there were words that were used during that rally caught on film and then shown on television, words that were really not good words, bad, bad words. And specifically, we're marching on Congress July the 4th, 400,000 strong. So very similar language actually here saying we don't like the government and we're going to march against the government. So that's what was happening in the Brandenburg test, but it was by the members of the Klan. And they said, uh, the Klan said, wait, we can't be charged with criminal syndicalism. This is our First Amendment right. And so the Supreme Court said, you know, actually, you're right, because here's the test. Imminent lawless action is not protected by the First Amendment. And in the Klan case, it was not imminent because they were projecting it into the future. So on July 4th, we're going to go march. But at the time of the actual rally was way before uh, July 4th. So it was not imminent. So that part of the test failed and they were found not guilty. They, their case was dismissed. All right. So just advocating in and of itself is not alone. You need to have some imminent lawless action, meaning it's about to happen. 
in order to be charged with that. Uh, four years later, the court applied Brandenburg to a defendant convicted under Indiana's disorderly conduct statute. Defendant was participating in a demonstration between 100 and 150 people when the sheriff gave an order to clear the streets. As the sheriff passed him, Hess was standing off of the street and said the words to the effect, we'll take the street later or we'll take the street again. Witnesses testified Hess did not appear to be exhorting the crowd to go back into the street. So they applied the Brandenburg test here and the court overturned his conviction. Again, at best, counsel for present moderation and at worst, it amounted to nothing more than advocacy of illegal action in some indefinite future term. So the imminentness, the imminent element to the Brandenburg test is key, all right? So they're advocating for a lawless action that needs to happen right now, all right? That's the key to the Brandenburg test. It's not imminent. Exactly, Gypsy, you got it. Exactly. That's exactly right, because it's not imminent, because it's in the future, uh, and that's also what separates the speech on January 6th because it was imminent, because it was let's go right now to the Capitol. So that is imminent and the lawless actions, of course. But that's what makes it so that it's not covered. All right. That's that's the key here. All right. Next. Uh, the last of the cases is the hardware case and the facts of which the court already has briefly discussed. Uh, we've got a speech here in the context of a boycott during which he said to several hundred people referring to the boycott violators, if we catch any of you going in any of them racist stores, we're going to do this to your neck. All right. So this was the NAACP. There was a boycott regarding a particular store that they felt was discriminating against uh, people based off of color. And so they said, hey, color, race. Uh, they said, hey, if you go in, we're going to uh, seek revenge. So that was another piece. So that's the other side of the Brandenburg test. Again, uh, here with that, they said the court held that emotionally charged rhetoric speeches did not transcend the bounds of protected speech set forth in Brandenburg. So even that statement was still protected. So. The reason I point this case out, the NAACP case, who remembers the statement, I could go to Fifth Avenue and do something and nobody would say anything about it, right? How is that speech okay? It's okay because of the NAACP case, all right? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Right, okay, so... Uh, again, if anyone's wondering how that speech is protected, it's protected by the NAACP case. All right, so let's move on here. Uh, the Supreme Court has not had occasion to apply the Brandenburg test in the 40 years <laughs> since that particular NAACP case. So just FYI, it's been 40 years. Uh, next, they go into uh, Trump's speech itself. So... Plaintiffs do not contend that the words prior to January 6th um, meets the Brandenburg incitement exception. So they're not saying any of his language previously is, is included here. They're only focusing on the rally speech and the court does as well. So they go into the language, and again, I'm not going to repeat these words, but they go into the specific language used in that 75-minute speech. I did do a live where I read his speech out loud, um, you know, with some of the details, and there's a lot of inciting language. I think we went through and kind of marked up his speech, saying maybe this was inciting, maybe this was not, maybe this one was political, maybe this one wasn't. So we did go through an analysis of that. Um, I do have that post on my Tube of View channel, so if you're interested in that. But here, they're quoting the specific language out of his speech and talking about whether or not the language itself is inciting. So then they're applying the Brandenburg test to that rally speech. So those words he was using, and they're saying, were we inciting uh, imminent lawless action? And the court in this case, in this appeal here, and let me flip here to the end. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Yes, this was uh, 
imminent lawless action. President Trump's speech was akin to telling an excited mob that corn dealers starve the poor in front of the corn dealer's home. He invited his supporters to D.C. after telling them for months that corrupt and spineless politicians were to blame for this and retold that narrative when thousands of them assembled on the ellipse and directed them to march on the Capitol building. So, yes, he was inciting the language. Uh, the language was inciting. So he failed the Brandenburg test. Yeah, don't, <laughs> please don't fight my moderators. They're working hard. My moderators are amazing. I'm so thankful for their time that they give to us. So let's be respectful, please. Appreciate it and thank you. He did say peacefully, but, you know, you can say peacefully in one sentence and then you can say, you know, fight like hell in the next sentence, right? So there's lots of words that can be used, but one time saying let's peacefully protest does not negate, negate the incited language. And that's what the court is talking about here as well. We have 75 minutes of a speech and within that one sentence, let's peacefully protest, versus 74 minutes of inciting language, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, let's keep skipping here. So that's really it for the First Amendment argument. I probably could do a full live just on the First Amendment. I will, maybe I'll put that into my um, piece here. Yeah, I mean, you can say it all you want. You can say, let's be peaceful all you want, but if your language is also, you know, we need to overtake the situation, you know, that's, that's not going to help you. District of Columbia law claims as well. Uh, these are set out. Negligence per se has gone through. Uh, Anti-bias statute. So they go into that as well. Again, I'm skipping through this because I want to get to the final holding in this case. Eating and abetting when it came to assault issues that had happened there. This entire appeal, again, is in order to see if these civil cases can go forward. And ultimately, the court said, yes, they can, although they did bump out Giuliani and Don Jr. So also, we've got the Westfall Act certification question that came up as well. So that, everybody, takes us to the conclusion for the appeal. All right, so let's go through this appeal. Yeah. How many times can he appeal and lose? A lot. <laughs> he can appeal a lot. It goes, it's, an, it's a never-ending story. <laughs> Drink. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. How do you change your nails so often? Yeah, there was an incident. <laughs> there was an incident yesterday. <laughs> So I had to, uh, <laughs> I had to change my nails. I'm kind of bummed about it. I'm still a bit bummed about it. I'm trying to keep up. No, it's all right. It's all right. Yep, yep. I'm loving the nail color. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the veggies. It's the celery situation that occurred. Oh my gosh. Oh yes, there were many reports written. All right. So let's go through what uh, this court has held then. For the foregoing reasons, the court holds as follows with respect to each of the three actions. So again, this is with regards to the lawsuits here that were going on. Um, hold on here, I need to readjust the situation. Yeah, oh, don't attack the mods, everybody, goodness. Yes, yes, I know, I know. My, I loved my nails yesterday too. I'm really bummed out. I'm really bummed out about it. <laughs> I'm really bummed. <sighs> All right, put it in a box, set it on the shelf. Here we go. Thomas v. Trump, Giuliani's motion to dismiss is granted and the motions to dismiss of President Trump, the Oath Keepers, and Tario are denied. Again, the reason Giuliani was bumped out of this case was because they did not prove the elements of conspiracy far enough. All right, so... Uh, he was uh, allowed out. Uh, Swalwell v. Trump, the motions to dismiss Trump Jr. and Giuliani are granted as to the claims. The motion to dismiss as to President Trump is denied. 
as to the 1985 claim, the negligence per se claims, the violation of District of Columbia's anti-bias law, and aiding and abetting. So these pieces of that civil case can go forward. But we do have the motion to dismiss granted regarding the 1986 claim. So that's the claim saying uh, the president should have done something. The intentional infliction of emotional distress has been dismissed. Negligent infliction of emotional distress has been dismissed, which makes sense. These are incredibly difficult to actually prove. And then negligence. Negligence has four elements to it. Uh, It has a duty, a breach of that duty, uh, causation is required, and then damages. And so the analysis here was we did not meet all four pieces in order to go forward on a negligence claim. But the negligence per se claims could go forward, all right? So some negligence were okay, but others were not. The court defers ruling on the Westfall Act certification petition and instead invites him to file a motion to dismiss where the court that the court will grant. Again, that was uh, whether or not the United States should come in as a party uh, to the case here. And then the blessing game v. Trump. Trump's motion to dismiss is denied as to Section 1985 claim directing, aiding, and abetting assault in violations of public safety statutes, and then granted, so these three claims are going forward, but granted as to intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is, again, very difficult to prove, punitive damages, that's where we have those huge um, punishing, punitive means punishment, so those huge damages in order to punish someone so they don't do it again, Uh, That's been denied. And then civil conspiracy in violation of common law. That has also been denied. So that civil conspiracy question was denied. So this, this case, everybody, is ongoing. It's still on the docket. We still have not had a trial on these cases. So these, um, Civil lawsuits are still going forward for the harm that was done to uh, the representatives, the batch of representatives bringing the suit, along with the D.C. police officers that were hurt during the January 6th speech. Can you explain part five for me? Um, Part five. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Part five. Five. Do you mean like the uh, analysis, which like an analysis or part five of the order here? Sorry. No, it's okay, Carrie. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. It's all right. Nope, no problem. No problem. Let me actually just leave the conclusion here, but with the sticky on it. Sometimes I'm flipping the pages too quick so my sticky doesn't get. So what kind of damages can be recovered? Medical bills only, lost wages. Yes, those would be um, some big pieces. Without punitive damages, now you're looking at the compensatory or actual damages done. And actual damages could be uh, were the officers no longer able to work anymore. What effect did it have on the officers' lives and the representatives? Do they have some, you know, trauma that has made it so it's difficult for them to go in and do their jobs, what kind of future wages were uh, affected because of that. So there are lots of damages that can uh, absolutely be found in these kinds of cases. So even without those multi-million dollar punitive damages, which again are in those cases where you're trying to get someone to not do something again, and this was a unique situation, so I'm not sure punitive would work. But it's absolutely possible to have a pretty significant award here. Does that include families of the officers? Yes, it does. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Were those persons outside U.S. federally defined jurisdiction in the District of Columbia? So the District of Columbia is there. The jurisdiction uh, for the federal rules when it comes to the different buildings and location that's it's complicated but it's all under the jurisdiction of dc so that's why this case is in dc because that jurisdiction is what's applicable here they're also suing the cops for standing on the standing on the sidelines that did nothing um what the heck are you talking about i didn't see any officers not doing anything 
Um, so I don't think that's supportive. Where did, oh, this gorgeous, oh, that's so sweet of you to say. Yeah, I got this um, in Key West. I don't remember exactly where, but um, this was on one of my adventures. When I was adventuring, <laughs> I was able to pick that up. Uh, and it was lots of fun. So, well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. What color is your nail polish? You know, it's actually, um, it's black, but then it's got like a gold sheen to it. So it's kind of fun. It's a little bit fun. Not as much fun as my nails yesterday, but you know, you can't live in the past. <laughs> it's all the officers. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was awful. It was awful. It was really awful. And if you uh, see the footage, you will see that as well. And you can also tell by the people who were given prison time for the harm that was done to the officers. And there were many. So you can take a look at, uh, at any of those orders, uh, judgments of those uh, different defendants who have been in, um, who've been put to prison. Most of the people in prison for January 6th were the ones that did harm to uh, officers. So that was pretty significant. It was significant. It was some serious damage that was done. Some serious damage. To me, this is another clear cut case for family. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think so. And if you think about it too, the representatives and everyone that had to be evacuated were probably, you know, going to continue to struggle with going into work every day. And would something like this happen again? I mean, there's all kinds. Um, there's all kinds of issues. All kinds of issues going on. Would that be criminal action for the police? I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, I think anytime you've got a mob situation, uh, the uh, police have certain protections in place because they're kind of trying to take care of the situation. Now, I'm not going to say that the police were not aggressive towards some of the protesters. I will not say that. And you can watch the video and see it yourself. But also, you have a handful of police officers and thousands of a mob coming at you. I'm not excusing anything. I'm saying let's just look at the facts on that. I think that's really important. Another round. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were a lot of things within the scope of their jobs. Well, yeah, I mean, again, if you look at any kind of a mob-type situation or riot-type situation, you know, uh, it's it's never pretty. It's it isn't pretty. But the officers in this particular situation, none of them were charged with um, actions that were inappropriate because they were within the scope of their jobs. As it goes for this particular situation, is it always that way? No. Uh, were some of them overzealous? I don't know. But in this particular situation, again, you have thousands of people coming at you. Uh, I'm not sure what you're going to do. And that's just the truth for any kind of a mob situation. Yes, many of the trials have already happened in D.C. and have been sentenced. People have uh, been given uh, probation. Some people have been just given fines. Some people have been put in prison. So there have been all kinds of different uh, ways that they have dealt with the consequences of the case. So lots and lots of people. But for any of the people that were involved in actually harming the police, yes, they were. most of them were given prison. Who's supposed to be in charge of the security? So here's, here's, my, here's my last piece about this, all right? When you have bad behavior, right, then you don't say to the people harmed, why didn't you stop the bad behavior? Like, it's not your job to stop someone from behaving badly. It's their job to not behave badly, so who was in charge of capital security doesn't matter. What matters is there was an angry mob rioting and taking over the capital. So focus, <laughs> focus on the harm here and not on the victim. All right. So that's really the key here. Victim blaming. Exactly. Exactly. We don't need to come in and say those officers did this and that and the other. Those officers were attacked by an uh, illegal mob of people trying to get into property they should not have had access to. That's what it's about. So that's the key. 
Yeah, that's that's really the key. And that's true for any case, any case, not just a mob, not just the police. That's true for anyone doing bad behavior that harms another person. The harmed person is not the one who should have stood up and stopped it. That's not their obligation. It's just not their obligation. Yep, yep. Uh, But I think that's a very common misunderstanding a lot of people have. And, you know, that's kind of uh, just how it happens. But I think if you ever work in the criminal justice system and you meet with the people who have been harmed, there's there's no way that uh, you can ever go back to feeling that way because it just doesn't work. Oh, we love you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. So I will go ahead on that note, on that soapbox. <laughs> Without, yes, you're the best. Oh, thank you. On that note, I will go ahead. Uh, right, right. Defensive strategy, exactly. I mean, there's all kinds of messes here. There's all kinds of messes. But in this particular situation, the security at the Capitol, who, this has never happened. No one has ever tried to overtake the Capitol. So how could they have possibly planned for it? They have it now. They've got something in place now because of this. But before that, who would have thought a group of people would try to take over the government? So at this point, I will go ahead and um, give you an update. I do plan on coming back later tonight at my usual time, my six o'clock, and I will be doing a Georgia update. We've got some new uh, updates out of Georgia, nothing incredibly significant, but a couple funny things actually The judge in Georgia uh, makes a reference to Monty Python in one of his orders, which I can really appreciate. So (laughs) that will be fun. Um, I will go through then that Georgia update tonight at 6 Central. Tomorrow, I will review the civil case again in New York. Uh, Tuesday, I will be only spending the time on the criminal case. Then I won't be back again till Thursday. We'll do another Florida update, and then I will start doing weekly reviews on Fridays. So I will be back again tonight at six o'clock and we will be talking about just a a flesh wound. (laughs) Yeah, it's really interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, this Georgia judge cracks me up. He absolutely cracks me up. Many thanks again. Oh, absolutely. So I will be back again tonight, everybody, and I will be going through the Georgia updates So take care, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. I will see everyone tonight. I do try to be organized, but (laughs) yes, on on here. Yes, I will be back here. So um, I do have a Friday evening's YouTube post coming up next, and then Saturday's post will be after that. So again, on YouTube, I'm kind of limited in when I can publish, but those will be coming up. I'm trying to kind of stay on top of that. But thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, moderators, as always. You are amazing. I'm so thankful for your time. So take care, everybody. I'll be back again, 6 o'clock Central Time, and we will be going over uh, the Georgia case. So.